present Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week from Adventureland, the Chrysler story and Prowlers of the Everglades. And now your host, Walt Disney. Looking over the scripts for our nature films, our true life adventures, an odd fact comes to mind. All of these scripts were written after the pictures were made. In making our wildlife films, we have a saying that nature writes the screenplays, we add the words for the narrator to say. Actually, it has to be this way, because we never know in advance what nature will offer or what the plot will be. Since nature calls the shots in our pictures, filming her creatures is always a gamble. Sometimes we reap rewards beyond our fondest hopes. At other times, we draw a blank. The sagas of the photographers who play these long shots sometimes turn out to be true life adventures in their own right. On this program, we're going behind the cameras with the photographic team on such an assignment. After that, you will see a completed picture from our True Life Adventure series, Prowlers of the Everglades. So now, let me turn you over to your guide and narrator, Winston Hibbler. Trying to predict the ways of nature is not only a gamble, the odds are always on her side. And this was certainly true when we set out to film the migration of the caribou for our forthcoming True Life Adventure, The Arctic Wilderness. Since earliest time, hundreds of herds of caribou have roamed the Arctic and subarctic regions of our continent. In spring, they migrate to summer pastures. With the coming of fall, they return to their winter quarters. But the broad plains of Canada offer few vantage points for photography. Over this vast area, the herds tend to scatter and spread out. So locating a single herd at a given time and place is very difficult. However, the rugged terrain of Alaska forces large concentrations of caribou to migrate through a few remote and restricted mountain passes. A place where this often occurs is in the Brooks Range, the northernmost mountain chain on the North American continent. Out of the heart of these mountains flows the Killick River to join the Colville on its way to the Beaufort Sea. And it's through the valley of the Killick that an immense herd of caribou usually migrates to and from their summer pastures. But nature has a way of changing even her best laid plans. And sometimes the herd chooses any of several different mountain passes. Well, this was the chance we'd have to take. And it was a gamble beset with many hardships. To do the job, we chose a team of naturalist photographers to whom hardship was no stranger. In filming our picture, the Olympic elk, they had encountered similar problems in equally difficult terrain. It was here, on the north slope of the Brooks Range, that Herb and Lois Chrysler set up the first human habitation in this region. The caribou will arrive in late autumn. It's already midsummer, and there's much to be done. The job of laying in firewood falls on Herb's shoulders. Supplying the household with water from a nearby spring is up to Lois. Housekeeping near the spring would have been more convenient, but convenience had to be sacrificed for an observation post from which to spot approaching caribou. The Chryslers had come here to film other Arctic wildlife too. And so it was necessary to leave the comforts of home from time to time. On these sojourns, rice was their main food. It was light and easy to carry, but it did make for a monotonous diet. True, there was game in abundance, but just one rifle shot could ruin a whole day's shooting with a camera. And so the Arctic stillness remained unbroken. 
and even in a warren of parka squirrels, the young are undisturbed by the presence of the photographers. But Papa Parka prefers privacy. Although callers are a curiosity, the camera is a contraption he can't comprehend. So, Pop goes the Parka. But the wily fox sees no cause for alarm. Her job is one of continual guard duty. If she suspected this invasion of her privacy, she'd move her family to some secret hideout in the dead of night. But with care and caution, Herb outfoxed the fox and got these pictures. With a price on its head, the Alaskan wolf has become a fugitive, and it took a lot of patience, perseverance, and a good telephoto lens to film these family scenes of a fast dwindling species. First singing lessons start early for the wolf pups. Grizzly bears are entirely unpredictable. Sometimes they'll run from man, but you can't rely on it. The most dangerous animal on the North American continent is the female grizzly with cubs. As an experienced naturalist, Herb Chrysler never ignores danger. But he has a theory that animals do not attack without provocation. The trouble with his theory, Herb admits, is the bears haven't signed the agreement. But bears have their problems. They itch. They're well equipped for scratching, but they can't reach all the places. So out of compassion and a hope for some photographic fun, Herb erected this back-scratching pole. In this treeless land, the bears had never before known the ecstasy of hitting just the right spot. Uh, down a little. Uh, up a little. Uh, no, further over. Uh, just under the left shoulder blade. <sighs> The Chrysler's field trips were interspersed with returns to the cabin. In the summer, the sun shines 24 hours a day. By July, the heat from the horizontal rays becomes almost intolerable. However, the summer sun did offer some advantages. The long, warm days stimulated quick growth in the vegetable garden, which furnished the Chryslers with much needed vitamins. As the season wore on, the wardrobe wore out. Still, even the most tattered garment had to be made to do. But now food, too, is critically low, and the plane with fresh supplies is long overdue. Bad weather may be the cause, or there's a chance of a crack-up. And only the bush pilot knows their location. Finally, late but very welcome, he pays his call, and uses a unique method for delivering an air-to-ground message. No caribou in sight yet. Where shall I drop the grub? With the target marked, the pilot starts his bombing run. Four, three, two, one, beans away. Chopping on the tundra is largely a matter of picking up the pieces. Nearly as important as food was the mail. But there's nothing as dead as yesterday's news. A 
unless you haven't heard it. To the Chryslers, the signs of winter bring the first fear that their venture may fail. The caribou should have gone south by now. Already the spring is frozen solid and water is available only from the partially frozen river. With each passing day, the chances become more and more remote that the caribou will come. Further portents of winter are evident as the bears dig frantically for parka squirrels in a last minute effort to fatten up for hibernation. But for one bear at least, it's a futile venture when the squirrel runs out the back door into the waiting jaws of an opportunist. If he doesn't smarten up, he may have to go to bed for the winter on an empty stomach. Finally, the river freezes solid, and ice must be chipped for drinking water. There's little hope now that the caribou will pass this way. The full blast of the Arctic winter is here. The herds must have taken a different route. Still, prospects brighten when the bush pilot makes a ski plane landing. It's hoped he's located the caribou. Chryslers, it's a welcome reunion. But the news was disappointing. The caribou have already crossed the mountains 25 miles west. It might as well be 2,500. And so the Chryslers make a strategic withdrawal. But no story of the Arctic could ever be complete without caribou. When the great herds march north again in the spring, the Chryslers will return to the Valley of the Killick. Throughout the winter, the caribou have ranged to lower elevations far to the south. Now the call of spring beckons them north again through the mountain passes of the Brooks Range. This is the signal for the Chryslers to return to their vigil, determined to photograph the migrating caribou for our feature picture, The Arctic Wilderness. Hopes are high, for they've arrived well supplied and ready to renew their gamble with nature. Soon the lookout in the cabin on the Killick is re-established. But the fickle caribou have already tricked them once, so the Chrysler scout all the nearby mountain passes for any clue that might indicate this year's route. Filming the caribou is their main concern, but they're also alert for other Arctic wildlife, and they keep their cameras rolling when they come upon a family of grizzlies just out of hibernation. Baby bears are not the most gentle playmates, and when they're triplets, the trouble is trebled. snowy ledge when bear battles bear, one is bound to go down for the count. With the coasting over, Herb directs his attention to a pair of two-year-olds. Their play is even rougher than the cubs. But mother is always close by to protect them from all enemies. She'll stay with them all through their second summer, but after that, they'll be on their own. Intriguing as the bears were, the lookout for caribou could never be relaxed. From the snow-covered high mountain peaks to the lower valleys, a constant camera vigil is kept. Finally, summer came, but not the caribou. A fickle nature, once again, had sent them by a different route. Although they had missed twice, the Chryslers still believed the law of averages would eventually bring the caribou here. And so, hoping for better luck this fall, they waited out the passing days. But there have been dividends for the time spent here. Hundreds of feet of film containing many unusual scenes of Arctic wildlife. All this film must be catalogued and labeled. Camera equipment must be checked and kept in order for the big day, the day the caribou arrive. 
But now the first snowfall and the fear of still another disappointment. Anxiety increases as the ptarmigan begins to change his summer plumage for a winter coat of white. But just when every sign points to another failure, there comes a new note of hope. Wolves have converged in the area. Restless, excited, they're continually on the prowl. Even the pups sense an event of major importance. The Chrysler's anticipation mounts too, or this could be the payoff. And it is. Closely following this monarch leader comes the vanguard. Then more, and still more, as the caribou pour into the valley in a spectacle seldom seen by man. The wolves are alert for a caribou kill, but so too are the caribou aware of the wolves. separate them, the ice proves an effective barrier between the hunter and the hunted. Out on the open tundra, any healthy caribou can outrun a wolf, and today it appears they're all in top condition. The lonely lament of the hungry wolf is the sad signal that there's been no kill today. But if the caribou escaped the wolves, they didn't escape the cameras of the Chryslers. For them, the gamble has paid off. Thousands of feet of film on the wildlife of the Arctic is their reward for the privations and hardships they've endured. So nature has written a new chapter in another true life adventure, the story of the wonders of the Arctic wilderness. In searching the globe for our wildlife stories, we quite often find them in the most inaccessible places. One of these, the Everglades of Florida, is our destination now. We're going on a true life adventure that will take us into the very heart of this primeval swamp that time forgot. Deep in this water wilderness lives a primeval reptile the Spaniards called El Lagarto, the lizard. We know him as the alligator. He's a creature whose way of life has continued unchanged for thousands of centuries. In the swampland, all of life follows a pattern of endless cycles, for these things are timeless and will never change. The life-giving rains that follow the drought, quiet watchfulness of the hunted, the silent menace of the hunter. And so this true life adventure is a story that has neither beginning nor end. For as long as nature preserves this water wilderness for her own, the prowler of the Everglades will survive in the swamp that time forgot. Have you ever seen a flirtatious fedora? Does your trash can sing or rock and roll? Have you ever heard a train talking? You will when you see our program next week. Here now are some highlights from that program. Next week, Walt Disney brings you Adventures in Fantasy. Roll, rock, roll, roll. Yeah.
Through the artistry of Disney cartoonists, you'll see how everyday things are given character and individuality. today. <sighs> For romance, there's the tender love affair between Johnny Fedora and Alice Blue Bonnet. It was love at first sight, and they promised one night they'd be sweethearts forevermore. This is Susie, the little blue coop. Her stirring adventures will make you thrill with excitement. Along the waterfront, you'll meet the cream of the international set, the sophisticated Frenchman, the prim little Dutch ship, this lofty British merchant, and uh, <clears throat> even the lowly tramp. You'll meet this haughty Spanish dowager and see how she gives Jolly Roger his comeuppance. Well, schwaggle me eyes. <laughs> And you'll see how little Toot, after making a bad start, redeems himself and carries on the tradition of his hard-working father. Yes, you'll see how anything that can be drawn can be given life and personality. Next week, when Walt Disney brings you Adventures in Fantasy. Your whole family will love Cinderella. Walt Disney's all cartoon feature, all in color by Technicolor. You'll rediscover the happiness and merriment, the fun and fantasy of this best love story in one of the most enchanting motion pictures ever made. Cinderella, spun of dreams, laughter, and romance, enriched with delightful music to put a smile in your heart. Watch your newspaper for the theater near you where you and your family can see Walt Disney's Cinderella. This has been an ABC Television Network film presentation.